without further ado, I will kick it over to you and Monica. Thanks again. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm Diane Silver. I am the advocacy manager for Fair Vote. And Monica? Hey everybody, my name is Monica Burke and I am the National Organizing Director at Rank the Vote and I'm super excited to connect with all of you today. Yeah, all right, we are gonna dive right in. So I am going to share my screen. Uh, is that looking good for everybody? I'm assuming so. Great. Looks great. Okay, great. All right, so um, yeah, this is who we are, woohoo. And so, oh, come on. Why is it not advancing? Why is it not advancing? Here we go. All right. So today's talk, here's what we're going to focus on. Four parts. Um, uh, we're going to do a quick overview um, and review of ranked choice voting. I know that most people in this audience know what ranked choice voting is, and so I want to respect that, but there might be a few folks who are still a bit new to it, so we'll do a quick overview. And then um, we're going to dive into the impact of ranked choice voting specifically how the results improve for women and people of color. Um, and then we want to talk about what is on the horizon for this year. And then we're going to end with how you all can help because that's kind of the whole point. So with that in mind, part one, here's the quick overview of what ranked choice voting is and how it works, just in case you're a little rusty or new at it. Um, the big idea is that ranked choice voting gives voters more choice and more voice for single winner, winner offices like like president, senator, governor, mayor, and district seats. If the city council is split up into districts and each district gets one person, these are all single winner offices. And so you get more choice, you get more voice for those kinds of offices. And then um, in addition, there um, there is another form of ranked choice voting for multi-winner offices um, that are like that are legislative bodies like city councils or Congress or state legislatures that works if more than one seat is elected by the same group of voters. So if it's if you're not carving the city council up into multi, into single winner districts, you can get proportional representation. I'm going to hold that part for another another time, and we're just going to focus on the single winner version for the moment. Um, so why do we need reform? Well, because our current system really limits voter choice. I think the prime example is what's going on right now, where it feels like the presidential primaries are already pretty much a done deal when 48 states have not yet voted. Um, and that is for both parties. So this is nonpartisan, bipartisan, cross-partisan. The problems are the same across the board. Um, Besides limited choice, we get vote splitting and strategic voting, which um, you'll know as the phenomenon when people say, no, no, don't vote for that third party candidate because you're just wasting your vote, right? Because you know that they're a long shot. They don't prob probably don't have a chance to win. And you're just taking a vote away from the major party candidate who you would have supported. And that will help the one that you don't want. And so people have this sort of conundrum. Do I vote for the one I really like? Do I vote my heart? Or do I vote strategically and vote for the one who I'm, you know, okay with, but they're my second choice, but I better vote for them so I don't get stuck with the one I hate. Um, Non-majority winners, when we have more than two candidates in a race, the vote is split more than two ways. And usually the winner has less than 50%. Not always, but very, but very often. So they might be the candidate with the most votes, but they're not the candidate with a majority of votes. When more people did not vote for you than did, you shouldn't be able to win office. And yet that's how our system works right now. Um, and the system is set up because of this sort of winner take all um, design of our current system, we get this toxic campaign cycle where it is strategically advantageous to cut down your opponent, to do character assassination, and to turn the campaign negative because it works. It feeds the tribalism and the partisanship of the electorate, and and it you know produces success. Um, and we want to get out of that toxic cycle. We have this political polarization. Many, many of our um, federal elections are non-competitive. The decision gets made in the primary. Like everybody knows this is a safe red seat or a safe blue seat. And so the, you know, who the winner is going to be is determined by who wins the primary. 
Um, our current system encourages gerrymandering. And the, the result of all of it is a lack of representation for all the different constituencies in our very diverse country. So um, the better solution is ranked choice voting, where uh, where all of those problems basically go away. So the way that it works is voters get to rank order the candidates um, rather than just picking one. And ranked choice voting promotes majority winners because if nobody has a majority of first choice preferences, then the candidates get eliminated one by one and we have a series of runoffs. It is just like an in-person runoff, except you don't have to go back to the polls physically, and so the participation doesn't drop off the way that it does when we have in-person runoffs. We can have as many runoffs as we need until we end up with somebody with a majority vote. So it's a really simple change that has these powerful impacts. So here's the big idea. Um, the way that it works, everybody votes, and in that first round, only the first choice votes are counted. And let's say that we had four candidates, and this is how the votes, you know, came out in round one. So you can see that the blue candidate has the most votes, but they don't have a majority. They don't have more than 50%. So what's going to happen is the lowest vote getter is going to be eliminated. And then we're going to have this instant runoff. But instead of going back to the polls, we're just going to count the ballots again. So if the, a ballot is, if the first choice is for blue or lavender or orange, those candidates are still in the race. Those ballots simply count for that first choice candidate again, just like if that person went back to the polls and physically voted for them again. It's only the supporters of this purple candidate whose candidate is no longer in the race. They're not in the runoff. So they have to pick somebody else. So they're going to have to vote for orange, purple, or blue. So the election officials or the computer knows who that ballot should count for. It's whoever they put second on their ballot, whoever they ranked second. If their first choice is out, their second choice will count. So then we count the ballots again. And you can see how those purple votes are now being added to the candidates um, according to how those those ballots were ranked. So once again, we've got a candidate who's got most votes, but they're not at 50 percent. So we're going to do it again. The lowest uh the lowest vote getter gets eliminated. We're going to count all the ballots again. If your first choice is no longer in the race, your ballot counts for your second choice. If your second choice is no longer in the race, your ballot counts for your third choice. And finally, in this example, there's now somebody who has majority. They're over 50 percent. And so they're the winner. So ranked choice voting is great because it promotes voter choice. We eliminate this vote splitting problem and the strategic voting, and that encourages people to run and to stay in the race. We're experiencing right now in the uh, Republican presidential primary how there were like nine candidates at the beginning of the game and already most of them have dropped out because there's, there's no path to success. Um, but with ranked choice voting, it encourages candidates to stay in the race because there is a path to success, because votes can coalesce um, around um, candidates with second and third choice votes. Um, it makes it more viable for people to stay in the race, and that gives more choice to voters and more um, more diversity of thought and discussion of issues. Um very significantly, it improves campaign civility because strategically as a candidate, it is not a good idea to alienate the supporters of your opponents. You need their second or third choice votes. And so you, you know, you don't want to do character assassination of their first choice. And so it naturally turns the conversation toward issues and takes, and takes away that mudslinging. Um, we end up with improved representation, especially for women and people of color, because of these other dynamics. And it creates it creates incentives for a broader engagement with the voters. You can't win uh, depending on solely your your base, your your core loyal base. You have to reach beyond your base and attend to the people who right now feel like they're not your constituency, and those those voters who feel like they're not represented by the person in office because they didn't help elect that person. And so it, it creates those incentives for the candidates to engage with all of their constituents, not just their loyal base.
Ranked choice voting is not new. It is in use um, all over the place. It's been in use for over 100 years in some other countries like Australia and Ireland um, and a couple of others. Here in the U.S., it's been in use for over 80 years in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They're the longest running one. And it's in use in all of these states, as you see. Um, there are two states that use it statewide, Maine and Alaska. There are a whole bunch of states there in the south in blue that use it for their military and overseas voters because they already have runoff laws and they recognize that there isn't enough time for ballots to get sent overseas for a runoff and get sent back in time. And so those voters get to rank order their ballots so that they can still have a voice if there's a runoff. But it's a limited it's a limited use. Um, there are going to be there's use in special elections in Hawaii. And you can see all these dots are the places where it's in use in cities. It's not statewide, but it's in use in over 50 municipalities um, across the country. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about where it's coming up um, for adoption uh, in, in this year or next. So um, you can find this map on the Fair Vote website um, if you uh, if you just uh, click around for where ranked choice voting is used or put that in the search bar. Um, and finally, I want to touch on um, a kind of a new flavor of ranked choice voting that is becoming prevalent because it's in use in Alaska, and that's the one that gets a lot of attention. It's called Final Five Voting. And in this one, uh, there is an open primary where all the candidates from all the parties are in one primary, all listed together. The voters get to pick one in the primary, and then the top five vote getters from that primary advance to the general election. That general election is then a ranked choice voting election where the voters have those five to rank. So it was used um, statewide in Alaska in 2022. You might have heard about it. Um, Senator Murkowski won under that uh, under that method, uh, Governor Bill Walker, U.S. Representative Mary Peltola, they were they were all elected in Alaska using Final Five. Um, it is on the ballot in Nevada for this year for the second time as a constitutional amendment. Um, to, to amend the Constitution, they have to pass it twice past the voters. It passed in 2022, and they're going to do it again in 2024. Um, there are some benefits of Final Five voting. Um, a, a lot of House districts are safely Republican or Democratic, which means that the winners are essentially chosen in the primary. And so it lets the whole electorate have a voice in who that would be. Um, and it also allows candidates from the same party to compete in the general election, potentially. And so it can have um, some benefits for intra-party dynamics, Um and it uh, gives the general electorate, um, which is more diverse, a more meaningful decision and a more meaningful voice. Um, and so and it, it just it promotes these positive incentives um, that have contributed to a bipartisan majority coalition in Alaska. We've seen that happen. So it's pretty exciting. There can be some some drawbacks. Um, it's not, it's kind of more of a weeding out process rather than a party nomination. Um, and it can provide some intra party conflict. Um, you know, as going to the general election, which is the yin yang of two people from the same party being able to participate. Um, some third parties are concerned that it can close out minor parties from that general if both, if the two major parties try to game the system in winning those top five seats. Um, so it's got some pros and cons, but it is definitely out there and it's being, um, it's being discussed. So, shoot, that was fast. I talked really fast. Um, but that's kind of the overview of what it is and how it works. And I'm going to turn the screen and um, the microphone over to Monica, and she's going to talk about why it's good. All right. I'm trying to stop sharing. Oh, all right. Go, Monica. All right. Can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, part two and part three here. Thank you, Diane, for that overview. So when we have ranked choice voting, what can we expect? What are some of the results that we can expect? Um, what have we seen in places where we are using it? And let's see if I can figure out how to move this. Here we go. Okay. So um, we're going to talk a little bit first about New York City. So 
New York City used ranked choice voting for the first time in June of 2021. So this is sort of a before ranked choice voting picture of the New York City City Council. Here you can see in this picture, there's a lot of men in this picture. Um, we've got some women huddled there around the uh, speaker, but it's 28% um, male and 28% female and 72% male. And after using ranked choice voting in June of 21 for the first time, that ha the percentage of women has more than doubled to 61%. And we are going to get a little bit deeper on this. So just visually, here is the new, um, the new city council from 22. Where, where we have more than double the women and a lot of women of color. And specifically, if you want to break it down a little bit more, we have um, a lot of women of color. There's uh, six white women, and I believe it's 25 women of color and 20 men. So the demographic has tremendously changed after using ranked choice voting in New York City. For this first election, here's just another picture of the women specifically on the city council. Uh, the women have won big in New York City, and they have also used it for their second election in June of 23 now. So this is from 21. We'll switch over to the results from another place, St. Paul, Minnesota. So there's been a lot of organizing in Minnesota for a long time. Amazing Jean Massey leading the charge over there for a very long time. And we have before and after in St. Paul, Minnesota. So you can see six men and one woman uh, before. And that was a number of years ago. And then um, in this last election, this past November, we now have a majority woman of color um, City Council, there's one white woman and six women of color in St. Paul, Minnesota. Very powerful there. Uh, Portland, Maine. So I'm actually going to try to see if I can get to my notes here. Um, okay, so in, I just wanted to back up for a Hello? minute. Just wanted um, to. So I'm not sure if this is still the case, but the Wi Fi was down for a little bit. Oh, wait, uh, hold on one second. Okay, we're good. We're back. <laughs> All right. I just got over to my speaker notes here. I did want to drop two little things in the chat. Let's see if I can do that. Um, chat. So one is a fair vote report, a deeper dive into New York City. And the second link is an infogram from Represent Women. Um, okay, so back to Portland here. So um, a couple of years ago, 2019, we had majority male um, city council. And in 2023, now we have majority female. Every district is represented by women. at So they have some district level city council members and they have some at large city council members. So we went from three, six to seven, four. And Maine has been leading the way on ranked choice voting for many years. Um, 12 years ago, ranked choice voting was used for the first time at the city level in Portland, Maine to elect the mayor in 2011. And eight years ago, um, in November 2016, they expanded their use of RCV from Portland to uh, be the first state to pass ranked choice voting at the state with a statewide ballot question led by citizens. That was in November 2016. And then Three years ago in 2020, Portland, Maine further expanded their usage to uh, approve it to be used um, for city council and school board beyond the mayor. And just two months ago, Portland has further expanded it to use uh, to switch the elections uh, for city council to use proportional representation, which Diane had discussed a little bit when she was talking. And so now uh, Portland will be joining Arden, Delaware and Cambridge, Massachusetts in using that. Hey, Monica, can you go back to full screen? Can I? Let's see. All right. Is that yeah. better? Thanks. 
Okay. All right. So what's on the horizon for 2024? So here we have a color-coded map. We've got some ballot question activity in 2024 coming up. We've got some potential ballot questions in 2026 coming up and some potential ballot questions in 2028 coming up. Um, there's a total of about 18 ballot questions that could be coming up over the next four years. So right now you can see in the green, we've spoken about how Maine has been leading the way um, for ranked choice voting. And Alaska has passed ranked choice voting as well for statewide. And now we have Montana, Oregon, Idaho, and Colorado uh, very likely to have ballot questions this year. Nevada has already passed um, ranked choice voting, but they have to vote again this year. They voted in 2022. They'll be voting again this year. And potentially South Dakota and Arizona. Um, then we have in 2026, following up behind all of that momentum and activity in 2024, we have another number of potential ballot questions in the state of Washington, in the incredible state of Utah. We have their executive director in Utah on this call. Um, they are using it in a number of cities in Utah. Um, Michigan may have a statewide ballot question. Michigan just won three cities this past November and Ann Arbor, Michigan in 2021. Ohio may have a potential ballot question and even Florida may go in 26 or 28, um, followed by some more states in the Midwest and potentially California in 2028. There are a number of cities that potentially might happen this year. Um, there's a whole lot of activity in California, Massachusetts, Ohio, Michigan, Maryland, and it, we're very excited that D.C. is probably going to be on the ballot. Boston is probably going to potentially be on the ballot. Denver, Colorado, San Jose, these are very big places. Um, to potentially be on the ballot. And then further expanding in New York, we've got Ithaca and Saratoga, Saratoga Springs. There are also a number of places where we cannot have ballot questions at the city level or the state level, but there's a lot of legislative activity in a number of states. A number of these states have bills for local adoption at the city level, statewide adoption, and federal adoption of ranked choice voting. Monica, if you'll just keep your screen up and, and advance. Oh, never mind. Well, I yeah. Think it's up. yeah. That's I, good. Can. I think it'll be easier. I'll just tell you when to switch. So okay. um, I'm going to finish up here with like how you all can get involved and help um, because that's what we're all here for. So if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, First of all, I really want to emphasize that we recognize that you have your own priorities. You know, we are not asking you to drop your mission and your agenda and suddenly like put all your effort into ranked choice voting. But um, I feel really strongly that ranked choice voting is a path toward accelerating project progress and success on like every other policy issue, whatever your mission is for your organization, if it's, if it's, you know, promoting, you know, helping women run for office, if it's about particular issues that are, that are especially important to women, um, you know, progress is, is being thwarted at all levels of government, especially in Congress, you know, especially the federal level, but also at the state level, because of the hyper partisanship that we're stuck in right now, it really, really cri cripples progress because in this tribalism that we're in, both parties have an attitude of, if we're not in the majority, we want to make sure that the other party that is in the majority fails. It is our number one mission to make sure they fail. And when that is the attitude of, you know, half of the legislature, then that's not a recipe for progress. There used to be a culture of bipartisanship. There used to be a culture of statesmanship. And these days, reaching across the aisle and working in a bipartisan way is considered a negative. You're not, you're, you're not showing party loyalty if you, you know, help the other side get any kind of success. And that does not serve the voters. So, you know, I really feel like whatever issue is your primary mission, ranked choice voting is a path toward getting that, setting up the system that will enable progress on your issue.
All right, enough of that. Go ahead. So the first thing that you can do if you agree that ranked choice voting is a good systemic reform that's going to help promote women's issues and women's uh, success as candidates, um, the first thing that we need is endorsement. So the groups that are working on ranked choice voting, whether it's a state organization or a campaign, they um, – very often have an endorsement page that looks like this. This is the one from the Portland, Oregon campaign back um, in 2022. And so what, what we need, what they need is to be able to have dozens and dozens of organizations that are endorsing the campaign and are willing to put their name and their logo on a page like this so that taken together, it's a powerful message and it's powerful signaling about the diversity of the constituency in that in that location um, that support ranked choice voting. It needs, we need to show voters that this is a reform with momentum. Um, I, I want to switch and show the, the Boston page, but I think I want to come back to that at the end, just in the interest of time. So we'll just go on to the next slide, please. Um, if you have capacity or and or it fits your mission to do more than just um, an organizational endorsement, then there's more that you can do to help. So the big idea would be to then adopt ranked choice voting as one of your own strategy priorities. And if you were to do that, what does that mean? What that means is get involved with the state or local RCV group in your state and or an actual RCV campaign. So we just went through the map where there's a whole bunch of campaigns um, coming coming up. Uh, so if you are in one of those states or municipalities that actually has a ballot measure happening, then you could get involved in helping to pass that ballot measure. If there isn't one where you live, there's probably a state organization. Um, if we go to the next slide, we've got a handy dandy map. Um, uh, Fair Vote has a map and Rank the Vote also has a map. So you have two places you can go to try to find your state organization. Um, I've got an example here. Um, this slide is not is not live, but if you were to hover, I hovered over the state of Ohio, and you can see how it popped up with how to get involved in Ohio. It says the group is called Rank the Vote Ohio, and you can click on it, and it'll take you to their page. You can do that with any of these purple states, and you can see that there's only, I think there's nine states that don't have an active group right now. All the purple states have an active group. And on the next slide, if you want, you can also go through the Rank the Vote website instead, um, and they've got a find your state map, and it's kind of the same thing. So uh, find that state group. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. You call them up, and ideally, you would partner with them, you know, have some conversations about what might be the win-win opportunities for some kind of a partnership. Um, next slide. So... Um, from that conversation, you'll probably figure out what, what other sort, sorts of specific things you could do to help promote ranked choice voting in your area. Um, beyond that, you can help to educate your own audience about ranked choice voting and then ask for their support in turn. So again, I, I'm not asking everybody necessarily to like drop what you do and start becoming ranked choice voting advocates, but if it's a win-win, if it dovetails with your mission and what you're doing anyway, then this would be something really valuable to help, you know, really um, expand exponentially the, the movement for ranked choice voting. So if that interests you, we can provide, we meaning fair vote and or rank the vote, we both have, have resources, talking points, graphics, materials, outreach training, letter to the editor training, social media toolkit, like anything that you want to use of like, how do I tell my people about ranked choice voting? We got you covered. Um, Moving on, uh, the other thing, another thing that you can do is if your organization endorses candidates, I know some do, some don't, depends on your 501, you know, your tax status, but if you endorse candidates, consider making ranked choice voting one of the platform planks that you would look for to give them that endorsement. Let, you know, let them know that ranked choice voting is something that you support and something that you want them to support if they want your if they want your support, <laughs> we scratch each other's back, right? Um, and then beyond that, you can, if, you're, if your organization can't do that, if you're sitting here thinking like, my organization can't do that, we're a 501c3, we've got our own mission, like I like ranked choice voting just fine, but that's not what we do, that's okay. 
you as an individual can also help the cause. So it's it's the same it's the same on ramp. It's the same thing. It would just be doing it as an individual instead of as an organization. You personally taking off your organizational hat and just wearing your citizen hat, you could get involved with your state group and help out as much as you can. Um, I know everybody has has day jobs. Life is busy. So you might be feeling like, man, I don't have a lot of time to volunteer for yet another cause. Um, that's okay. <clears throat> Number one, just putting your name on their list lets them demonstrate to legislators how many voters in their state or in their city support ranked choice voting. It also lets them contact you when there is a call to action. If they're trying to move a bill through the state legislature or they're trying to move a measure through the city council, there's going to come a moment when they need a whole bunch of constituents, a whole bunch of voters to message those elected officials to, so that they will know that this is something their constituents care about. When we are working behind the scenes with, um, you know, with legislators or we've got key people in states working with legislators and they're saying, hey, will you help, you know, pass this bill through your committee? One big response we get from the legislator is, I don't think my constituents care about this. I never hear from my constituents on this. This is not a thing. And so, those messaging campaigns are really, really important in the moment. And so if your name is on the list of the RCV organization, then they can get in touch with you when they need to do that call to action. And we need like this week, we need thousands of voters to take one minute and send a text message. That's not a huge lift for you, but we need to have that list in place. And that's why joining uh, that list, signing up with the organization as a supporter is really, really important. Um, so you can do that as an individual just under your own name, even if you can't do it as an organization. Um, and then the last thing would be influencers. Who do you know? Who do you know? Who are your connections? And who do they know? Who has the ear of those decision makers? Who do those decision makers know and trust? Um, it, sending the right messenger is absolutely the name of the game. And so, you know, we do our best. We work hard um, on that. But having more people out there who maybe have connections, especially at the municipal level, you guys, this is a powerful group of people. I am so amazed and impressed and excited about this Women's Power Collaborative um, because of the power of connection and the power of, of, of networking. So I know that there are folks on this call who have more influence than I do. <laughs> and so we need that influence, that when the moment is right, that hearing it from you, or maybe not from you, but you know someone who knows someone, and oh that's God. how politics yeah. works, right? So, um, so those are tons of ways that you could help promote ranked choice voting um, based on your own time and capacity. Um, so I hope this has been super fast. We have about 20 minutes left. Um, we want to open it up for questions and discussion and engagement. Um, but I hope that if you weren't sold before that you are now, and if you're not, speak up so that we can convince you some more. <laughs> All right. Um, Victoria, I think I'll turn it back to you to kind of facilitate Q&A. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, to the both of you. I really appreciate it. Um, it's always so nice. I just see so much Maine love and I love it. For those that don't know, I live in Portland, Maine. I'm a member of the Portland City Council. So slide 28. I'm biased, but it was my favorite slide because I was in it showing the new uh, women-led council here in Portland. Like you said, we, for the first time, have every district led and represented by a woman for the very first time. It's very, very exciting here in Portland. Um, so I'm really happy to see so much Maine love. Thank you all so much um, again for the great presentation. We're going to open it up to Q&A. I saw a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I want to do a quick scan just to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. But we're just going to do it in a raise your hand fashion. Um, I think that that's easier. So for questions, discussions, comments, I know it's always a little nerve wracking being the first one to ask a question, um, but go ahead and just share your thoughts. And I'm going to do a quick scan in the chat to make sure I'm not missing anything. So I will open it up for anybody who has a question for Diane or Monica. 
And I just dropped a couple of things in the chat. Um, there's a website on Fair Vote with legislation, so you can check that out. I also dropped a video that you might want to wait until after this call ends to watch. It is a little 30 second on a number of states and what they're working on in 2024 for their goals for the year and a recap of what they did in 2023. So that's a very cool video if you want to see what's happening across the country. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for everybody posting in the chat as well. It's been really helpful. Um, we will go to the first question I see, the first hand up. Um, Stephanie, go ahead. Hi, I thank you for this session. It was very helpful. I put my question in the chat, but I'll ask. Um, how does ranked choice voting help with um, instilling some confidence in the voters, right? People are concerned about, you know, ballots not being counted, you know, I'm on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> question, Stephanie. Um, this is my answer. The the distrust in election results and an election, you know, process that that we are dealing with right now stems from dissatisfaction. Um, it's being fed by by dissatisfaction, but it it is taking hold and it's resonating with voters because they are unhappy with the results of elections. Um, we have this hyper-partisan black and white either or scenario where if your candidate doesn't win, then you have lost, my side lost. And that breeds dissatisfaction. And so when somebody suggests that maybe you didn't lose, maybe it was fraud, maybe it was rigged, maybe it was whatever, it's, it's easy to embrace that because you want to feel better about it because nobody likes to feel like they lost. Ranked choice voting changes the psychology of those results because we have found, we have data for this, um, to win majority is getting over 50%. That's what it takes to win. But what, when we when we look at the result and then look back um, at the cast vote records, we can see that the winner was in the top three rankings for more than 70% of the voters. So it's not just that they won by 50%, by more a little bit more than 50%, 70% plus had them in the top three. And that changes the feelings of the voter. You, you feel like, well, I didn't get my first choice, but I got my second choice. I didn't get my first or second, but I got my third. For 70% of the voters to feel pretty okay with the result, even if they're not, woohoo, my number one choice won, to, when they feel pretty okay about who won, then that whole dynamic of fraud, rigged, yada, yada, it doesn't resonate anymore because people are not as dissatisfied. And so I think that that this having this reform, having a method that breeds satisfaction will in turn breed confidence. Now, that's a hypothesis. I don't have data to prove that. We do have the data that shows the top 70, more than 70% have the candidate in their top three. That's my hypothesis about the psychology. But I feel, I feel really strongly about that, that that's a dynamic that will, that will um, be borne out as we get more and more uh, jurisdictions using ranked choice voting. I'll just add to what Diane said. In reality, when you pass ranked choice voting on the hyper-local level, most likely, uh, depending on your state, you may need new machines and you may need new software upgrade to those machines. And uh, potentially the machines, you know, could be a security risk right now. They could be quite old. So actually getting the new machines and getting the software upgrades will make people feel more confident because you will have the latest and greatest. So that is the reality of this as well, is that you will get better machines and better software. Thank you both so much. Um, I appreciate it. So thank you for your questions. Um, feel free to keep putting your hands up or putting questions in the chat. We'll make sure that we grab all of them in the time that we have left. So now I will go to Kathy. Oops. There we go. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, one is there is an important election uh, for our at-large city council people where you elect two at a time. So people are flummoxed by that. And 
um, they're used, uh, often people will just vote for one, even though they can elect two, and they call it bullet voting or something, right? So that's one question that, you know, when you see all these demos about ranking choice voting, it doesn't address one of the major elections of D.C., um, and I think then people get confused. So it's more of a statement than a question, but how do I deal with that? And the the real question, the one that's most distressing, is that, and I put the link in the chat where there was a newspaper article where the Democratic Party has filed a suit against this uh, initiative to have ranked choice voting for, for D.C. And the reason is because they think people of color and old people will be confused. I mean, ageism, racism, I mean, every piece of this is distressing. <laughs> um, and it's been initiated by an older Black woman, so I'm not quite sure how she got to that, um, except that she's afraid to give up her queen maker status or king maker status. Um, and I don't know how to, I mean, I, I, I think this is a safe enough environment for me to voice this in a way that I hope is not um, embarrassing in any way or uncomfortable, but holy moly, I mean, really? This is, yeah. and how do you, how do you, Kathy, it's so frustrating, and I mean, you're, you're spot on. We certainly, you know, we know that that argument. So, I, and I think that you hit the nail on the head. Just, you know, just between all of us chickens here, we know that the reason for opposition is that the people who are in power feel threatened, right? This is going to change the dynamic, and it's going to put power back to the voters. And, you know, number one, the people who are winning elected office under the current system Many of them are enjoying power. They're enjoying being elected, not by majority, but because of those the split vote, the vote splitting dynamic. And it's working for them. And gerrymandering is working for them. So, of course, they don't want to change it. But we don't want to say that out loud to them because we don't want to diss them. We, we want their cooperation. Um, and the second part is exactly what you said. There's a lot of party power brokers who are not elected officials. They're the behind the scenes power brokers and they have a lot of power. They are the king makers and the queen makers. They decide whose turn it is. And you, you know, and they um, enjoy having everybody working to curry favor with them in order to get their support. And this is going to put power back to the voters. And so it weakens their power. So it's not a great surprise that there's opposition. But of course, they have to come up with excuses for why for why it's a bad idea. And so those excuses are things like this is going to be too confusing, too confusing for older people, too confusing for people with less education, which cor often correlates with people of color, yada, yada. So um, we do have data. I'm happy to say that part we have data that shows that ranked choice voting um, does, you know, basically isn't confusing. There isn't more ballot error with ranked choice voting than there is with other kinds of voting. Um, it is not perfect. Nobody has ever said that it's perfect. Um, and it doesn't necessarily improve the, the rate of voter error, but it doesn't make it worse. Um, I think the bottom line is like some people are going to make errors on their ballot. Like errors happen. People make mistakes. Um, and that happens with all kinds, of, with all methods of voting. Um, and so, but there's no, there is, there is no data that shows that, that it's increased. Um, and so, I mean, that's the, that's the stat that we, that we lean on to say, that's just a, that's a false, that's a high, you're, you're, it's a false claim. Um, and I think the, how do you address it? I can sit here and diss the people who are saying that, but you know, in working with them, we want to be respectful. I think that I think that the way to do it is through one-on-one -on -one conversations and asking, like, would you be willing to engage in a in a serious conversation about the pros and cons about this? You know, I mean, if you're dead set, you know, 
if you've already taken a position and you're absolutely not going to budge from your position, then we have nothing left to talk about. But if you're open to having a conversation about the pros Mm -hmm. and cons, I'd love to address your concerns. You have very legitimate concerns. I respect them. And let's talk about them. First one, you're concerned about confusion and ballot error. Let's look at the data and then you can, you know, present the data. The other thing is that if you end up having conversations, I think, you know, in a group of people and you've got somebody making those kinds of arguments, you might not sway that opposition person, but it's valuable to present that rebuttal because you might sway all the people who are listening. Um, Sorry. Uh, yeah. You might sway, you might sway all the people who are listening, and so it's worth it to um, to give that rebuttal. But um, even though we know, I feel like why the opposition is out there, it's still more strategic to try to get them on our side. Yeah, yeah. And the question on um, electing two people on the for that position, but that really throws everybody. So, are there is there a really good like the demo slides you did on, you know, yeah. rolling over. Is there the equivalent for the two positions? Voter, well, voter education is certainly an important part of rolling out ranked choice voting, especially the first time that it's being used. And there's been there's been really great trailblazers. Again, like shout out to Maine, <laughs> shout out to New York City, shout out to Alaska. There's a lot of folks who have gone before. Um, And we have great examples of voter education materials that are put out um, leading up to the election to let voters know the ballot is going to look different this time. Here's the instructions. Here's how you do it. They put demos, you know, demos online where you can practice, you know, ranking your favorite ice cream so voters can can get familiar with it. Um, So it definitely needs attention. Um, But it's in my mind, it's not a deal breaker. And that's what we want to emphasize to people is that yeah. voter education is always important. Voter instruction instructions on the on the on the ballot is something that you have to do anyway. Right, right. But it's just different when you're when you're when it's um, two people being elected out of the list of eight or nine so candidates. The, the answer to both of your questions, just like Diane said, it's all about education and yeah. what tools that you can do is um, have an FAQ with all of this supposed opposition set up and uh, for your jurisdiction that you're mm-hmm. passing in. Uh, did you say that you're in D.C. with those folks? Yes. Okay, super. Yeah. So one of the best things you can do is have an FAQ question answer. I mean, Washington, D.C. is 63% have a bachelor's degree, you know, Alaska, 42%. And 85% of Alaskans reported that it's simple, right? So hard, factual data, FAQ, presentations, be on the ground, do town halls, become a trained speaker. I'm pretty sure that the DC campaign has that all, um, they're cranking all that out. I'll just, you know, I'm sure you don't need like our speaker training because I'm sure that they're doing it, but Rank the Vote also has a speaker training that you can do or that anybody else in the in yeah. DC can do. But it, it is just what Diane said. It's just the education, right? Have the website set up, have the social media set up, do the town halls, do the education for the voter education and then the candidate education. So you don't have candidates in DC that are running for these offices that are like, I'm against this, right? Yeah. So yeah. Well, that's- candidates who's going to be at the bullhorn, right? Like who's got the influence? Make sure all of the various influence. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you both. And I'm going to dash off um, in a minute because I don't have a dash off. meeting. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Joanne, I see, your hand up. I see your hand up, but Lindsay, I just wanted to make sure you were all set because I know you had a, I saw a hand and then now I don't see a hand. I just want to check. Yeah, you can go to Joanne because I think she has something related to what Kathy okay. was asking about with the city council. Thank you, though. Perfect. All right, Joanne, go ahead. So it seems to me that the answer to Kathy's question is to look at what Cambridge, Massachusetts does because they elect their city council at large districts as well. And so ah. you vote for several folks and it's a little okay. difficult to understand because it has to do with first transferable votes, but yeah. that's that's what the Cambridge model is the model that's been in effect since what forty one. Um, ah, my sister okay. votes in it. She doesn't seem to have any trouble learning how to do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem so hard to me, but but um, people are flummoxed. 
or fear that they will be flummoxed maybe is as much of anything. Thank you, Joanne. And All right, I'll let you guys get back. In the link that I dropped, there's also a letter to the editor training that might be really useful in DC and in other places that are passing it. And then there's also a canvassing training as well. So um, the speaker training, the canvassing training, the letter to the editor training, just get out there and do all the uh, education. I think that's probably related to my question I was going to ask because I'm just thinking, so I'm in Oregon and this will likely go to a ballot measure. If I'm a voter, like what are the what are the downsides for me? You know, as you're having these conversations with people and I get maybe the confusion because it's new and people don't like change, but it seems like such a win-win for the voter. So are there any downsides or like as you're having those conversations, are there certain kind of like points people keep going back to? in terms of like the cons or the downsides of, of RCV as, as just kind of like your average voter? Wow. Uh, I mean, that's a loaded question, Lindsay, because obviously as, as an advocate for right choice voting, I think the answer is no. I think this, I mean, the reason that I pour my heart and soul into this reform is that it really resonated with me as this, like win, win, win reform. I don't see any downsides. I mean, I think, you know, the argument of, oh, it's confusing is, is really, is really, it's new. It's just, it's what Monica just said. I mean, it's different. It's a change. So it's going to require a little bit of getting used to. But I think that because this is the way we've always done it, is not a good reason for continuing to do something a certain way. You know, if that was the truth, we would we would all be driving, you know, horse and carriage buggies, you know, yeah, because that's be the way we've always done it, right? We are that we are using a voting system that was designed in the 1700s, 1800s based on the technology of the time. Um and and we used it, and it was designed to be a living system. I think our founders recognized that they needed to build into our constitution and into our processes the ability for things to change with the times. That was part of their vision. And we have lost that aspect of our democracy in that we have frozen things in time, and we're using systems that are archaic. So I would argue that we should not be afraid of change. We should embrace change in the way that we have embraced, embraced so much other technology. I think that, that, you know, maybe voters would feel like the, that, that might be an argument that opens a Pandora's box of like, I don't trust technology. I don't trust the, 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 the computer. What about AI? Yada, yada. You know, and, and the answer to that is there are already protections in place to ensure the integrity of the count and the integrity of the vote. Doing Changing from pick one ballots to ranked ballots doesn't have anything to do with vote tampering or ballot box stuffing or anything like that. All of those are already, are already problems or concerns regardless of how you mark your ballot. How you mark your ballot doesn't change any of that. And we already have really good protections in place for all of those things. We have audits and we have chain of custody. That, I mean, election officials are um, do an amazing and frankly unappreciated job of carrying out, you know, a very, very um, critical and challenging task uh, and ensuring that it's done correctly. And they have a bazillion protocols in place to ensure integrity. So I think that we don't need to be afraid of the technology that allows us to do ranked ballots. Um, it's change, it's new, um, but it's for the better. I mean, that, that that's what I would say. In terms of the machines, the upgraded machines that the state will get will help with the ranked choice voting elections and the non-ranked choice voting elections. It will help the clerks with minimizing mistakes. I've seen this in my own town where they have made mistakes. And if we had the new machines that were not incredibly old with the newer software, it would help them in both the ranked choice voting and the non. So it's actually a win-win for the seats that um, y'all are voting on to use ranked choice voting and the the ones that will still be plurality. So um, it should help all the elections. Great, thank you both. Thank you both so much.
right on time. It just turned two o'clock. Look how perfect that was. Thank you so much to everybody for coming. Please give a huge virtual somehow mm -hmm. round of applause for Monica and for Diane for extending their time, their expertise, their knowledge. They did such an amazing job. Um, I really appreciate it. Such a wealth of knowledge. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being here. This session luckily was recorded. Thank you, Diane. So we can make sure that we share this far and wide. We will put this in the Women's Power Collaborative. We will share it via email. Um, if you or someone you know wants to see this again, um, we'll make sure that we get it out there so that you can share it with your networks. Tell all your friends about the Women's Power Collaborative as well. We look forward to having more of these conversations on a monthly basis within this space. If you have any questions, don't uh, hesitate to reach out to myself and I'll make sure that I point you where you need to go. There's also a ton of information in the chat that's really helpful. So I'm actually gonna keep the meeting open just for a couple of minutes for those of you that wanna scan the chat grab some important links um, and all the things that you need. And we will see each other next time. Thank you all so much for coming. Have a good rest of your day. Mm -hmm.